Hello, and welcome to Makers.dev, episode number 99. Chris, did you know that 99 is a Capricar number? Capricorn? No. Cap Capri Capricar, K-A-P-R-E, oh. is that right? K K-A-P-R-E-K-A-R. No, what is a Capricar number? Well, I'm happy you asked, because I just <laughs> looked this up before I said it. A Capricar number is a number, get this, where if you square the number, the s you, you can take substrings of that number and then parse them as an int and then add them together and get the original number. So 99 squared is 9801 and 98 plus one is back to 99, the original number. Nine right. is also a Capricorn number because nine squared is 81 and eight plus one is nine. Okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah, I don't know why this is like, well, who cares, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a thing, Capricorn number, and it's the episode number 99. Cool, well, there yeah. you go. Uh, that reminds me of me watching, like, th there is, what channel is it? There's a YouTube channel where they, no, number file, where they draw stuff on, like, like brown paper, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's really low budget, but they always have something very interesting to say about math that doesn't affect my world at all, <laughs> but is all, always very interesting. So, yes. there you go. If anything, I think this might help me remember that the square of 99 is 9801, which may, but then also it's just like a little bit less than, what would that be, 10,000? I don't know. Yeah. 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 It's a cool thing. Uh, happy Thanksgiving. How was your Thanksgiving? Yeah. Uh, it was good. Uh, we went to the grandparents' house, um, or my in-laws' house, and the uh, we... we ordered uh chicken instead of having turkey which i recommend uh fried chicken from <laughs> cracker barrel is delicious and uh everyone should do that um, much better and, like, yeah. turkey's not very good <laughs> it's like, very dry like that's yeah. why we have gravy because it's like way too dry as a as a meat without it yep yeah um and then because we're not going to see them at christmas they uh got uh, the kids got some early Christmas presents, which was a slot car racing set. Hmm. Um, and at first I was like, okay, grandpa remembers this from his, you know, youth. And so the kids will see how they do. They actually really, really liked it. It kept, kept yeah. them busy for hours. And they even did that instead of watching a movie at one point. Um, uh, that's great. Uh, part of it is like, you can crash the cars. And so uh, I think that cool. adds an element of risk, you know? Um, yeah. So they played with that for hours. A slot car racing game? Set. So, set. yeah, so what, it's a what physical thing. Like, imagine Hot Wheels, but slightly yeah. bigger. And then they uh, there's a little pin on the bottom that goes into a slot on the track. Mm -hmm. And then the track has two two lanes and two metal pieces on e each side of the slot. And the metal pieces, I think, are directly wired to direct current. Like, like, you plug it in, and it's directly wired to the direct current. So you do right. have... I think it's sort of dangerous. <laughs> yeah, don't <laughs> like, like that. <laughs> you're right, exactly. Um but I mean, it's it's probably like five volts DC, so it's not that bad. Okay. Uh, and the um, and then the cars have like these fabric metal brushes on the bottom. And yes, so yes. Always in contact with the the metal brushes. Uh, I had one of those things. growing up. I got I got yeah. one for Christmas when I was like eight, and I loved it. I think and it, it was like plastic yeah. pieces mm -hmm. with with the metal ridges in it. Yep. And then uh, there, there were little uh, controllers that you could hold. Yep. And then and it took a few laps for it to warm up. You had to like push it past parts where i think oxidation had, had messed with the oh, contacts sure. yeah. but then after you'd, you've gone through a lap like five times then it's actually racing around and then yeah there's parts where it like crosses over and so they can yep. crash into each other yeah oh that's really cool okay yeah i i didn't know it was called a slot car racing set Neat. yep that's what it's called and uh so now they have one and i have to find a place in the basement to put it uh probably make a table for it because it's like if you put it on the floor someone's gonna step on it and break it so that's more work for me but that's okay <laughs> i wonder if you could manufacture more track for that and then also boost the voltage so then you could have it like going around your entire basement because i imagine buying the oh. official track would be really expensive but if you could like 3d print the track or that, that'd be a lot of plastic if you could if you could get the track from somewhere else and then just like slot in the the metal and then yeah. just have it be way way bigger i think it'd be cool. i mean well, i don't know so you can buy extension you know track and it's mm. not that expensive um but you're right that at some point the you know it's like a model train set um it's it operates on the same principle so like the dc voltage at the very far end is going to be way less yes um so yeah you're right that um but at the same time like at the current voltages uh they go too fast like you if you just hold down the thing it'll just yes. fly off the track yep <laughs> and yep, so uh it has room to grow so yeah i could try to greatly expand the track i don't know that's really cool what a cool model of being able to race cars because the, the 
alternative to that would be that the car itself is powered. But I think the advantage of this <laughs> is that the car only has to have the contacts and, and then a little motor in it. So it can be much yep. lighter weight. It doesn't have to have the power on board. Um, yeah, that's, that's really cool. Uh, anyway, I want to so take that back up from my childhood now. Uh, yeah. Cool. What else is going on? How's the, the Kaggle gravitational wave competition going? Yes, Kaggle gravitational waves. I'm currently in 17th place out of 700. Um, so doing pretty well. And it, that should have been higher, but I bungled one of the submissions. Uh, so when they reset today at 7 p.m., uh, I should go probably up a couple places, I think. And uh, yeah, I think like 10 top 10 places is gold medal. So that's what I'm shooting for. I already had one team reach out and try to partner up. And then I was like, uh, I can't because then you couldn't win prizes uh, since I'm a uh, Google employee. And they were like, oh, yes. OK. <laughs> and then, so, oh, uh, that, that is a disadvantage for you then of uh, not being able to, to get gold because you to get gold, yep. you or to, to get grandmaster status in Kaggle, yeah. you need one more gold, two more gold, two more golds, two yeah. more golds. OK, so you would, you would have to find a team that doesn't care about getting the cash yeah. prize oh. part of that or solo gold two more times which is playing on hard mode for sure right <laughs> yeah um but i'm feeling pretty good about this one like i still have room to go like i have more ideas and this is like uh, oh i i use your end graph trick um and oh, over the break yeah that totally cool. worked I, I didn't have time to like build a script to reset it if it failed or whatever but it didn't mm. fail it it was up all five days or something cool um so i was able to run experiments while i was away and uh yeah i still have things to try out and it's just a lot of like you try it and then it's like that doesn't work you try something else and it's like that sort of worked and you do that a hundred times and then you have a much better model and you do it a hundred more times and that's uh, sort of just a metal bottle yeah. of learning anything in the world right like yeah. you just just keep trying it and, and see what works and what doesn't yeah uh yeah so that's going pretty well um, i now have to i still have to write the paper for my class uh, mm. which i'm doing on this competition but i have to come up with an experiment that i can explain within a paper and then mm. like do it so that means taking time off of trying to get a really good score and trying to make instead like a repeatable experiment um that i can write a paper about so uh, i have to do that and that's due like in a week so gotcha yep okay cool i would love to know more about gravitational waves i when you did the gps competition i feel like i was able to get a much better understanding of how gps worked what uh, what's the deal with gravitational waves my, my current understanding is like there's a fabric of space time which i don't fully understand but i've seen the videos where it's like the person puts the bowling ball on the stretchy material and yep. then they roll another ball and then it hovers around the ball and that's supposed to be an explanation for how like orbits work and how gravity's working uh so i understand the models behind that but i don't feel like i have a good intuitive sense of what that what's actually happening like in the world and then if a big event happens so like a black hole would be in this analogy of the bowling ball on the stretchy fabric it would be like if the bowling ball exploded that would cause a ripple in that fabric and you're you're able to listen to the ripples of that fabric and try to hear events that happened in space time really far away is that is that accurate uh, so, sort of yeah mostly yes um so imagine that but instead of uh, a bowling ball exploding what we have is two bowling balls circling each other okay um so that's what we're trying to detect here is a continuous gravitational wave which so they're circling each other forever basically yeah um and then like you have your finger imagine you're blindfolded but you have your finger on the very end of the trampoline or, or fabric or what mm -hmm. you know and so you're trying to detect if two bowling balls are circling you know far away with your finger on the the edge of the the fabric um and it's very very difficult because you can imagine like the wind blowing and that moves your finger right but that is not the same as two bully balls circling right so you can have events um so these detectors are, are based on earth um and which means you can have events like earthquakes mm -hmm. you can have events like uh people dropping tools in near the detectors yeah. that <laughs> registers yeah um you can have events like oh you can have like um you know like a 60 hertz uh line like because you know if you're plugged into mains on in the u.s it's 60 yeah, hertz yeah. and so if you're not shielding correctly then you can have this line at 60 hertz which kind of looks like a continuous wave but it's not mm -hmm. um so yeah you have all that stuff that you have to try to filter out and listen for this very 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 faint you know oscillation i, th I may have asked this question before why aren't we doing this in space why aren't we doing this like to the moon i think because it costs a lot of money <laughs> Okay. Uh, you can build a it's a you can build a four mile tube or there's two two four mile tubes at 90 degree at 90 degree angles right yes um you can build that on earth uh turns out to be very expensive to put into space i mm. think but i think it would work in space i guess because the moon the moon's moving around all the time 
Hmm. Yeah, then you have a secondary like variable. Yeah, if, if you have, if you put it like on satellites, then the satellites are moving relative to each other. Yes. Also, which seems pretty hard <laughs> to figure out. <laughs> yeah. Maybe if there was a satellite that was orbiting Earth the same way that the moon was orbiting, then you could have like like you know that yeah. a vector from the moon to the Earth always went through the position of the satellite. And you figure out where to put the satellite so that that's true. And then you just have a laser going from the satellite to the moon. But then I guess that's that's only one vector, and then that vector is constantly changing direction. So like you couldn't get a you couldn't get an easy right angle to it unless we make a new moon. <laughs> a second moon. <laughs> that's right. Ninety degrees from um, from the existing moon. You also if you shot it to the moon, so the the current uh gravitational detectors are like four they're like three or four kilometers long. Okay. Um and you can have a laser which sort of stays relatively tight for three or four kilometers. Right. Um, you can't have one that stays relatively tight all the way to the moon. There are reflectors on the moon, but you need extremely powerful lasers. And I don't think you could detect like time of arrival. I think it's mostly like, hey, we got a very, very uh, weak signal back okay. uh, just because the moon is so far away. So you need like two satellites in space. No, three satellites in space at 90 degree angles that are four-ish miles apart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'd be that'd be tough. You almost don't want them on Earth if you could just have them sort of floating off orbiting the sun. Yeah, Th then you need to put them in escape orbit from Earth, which is, you know, I don't know how much that costs, a billion dollars. Yeah, stuff. right. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. So so okay, so we have on Earth because it's much cheaper. Uh, uh lasers going at right angles and they're really far apart. And we talked about this before, but you're you're listening for subtle variations in the distance between those things. Even though the distance looks like it's fixed, if there's a ripple in space time, which is wild for me to think about because that means like ripples are happening through me, changing like my size. <laughs> like, that's, yeah, that's cool. Uh, okay, so so if a ripple happens, you're able to tell because the light takes longer or shorter to be able to travel that distance um what's the output from this what what do you what do you, you get what a you signal it, look, it looks like an audio signal so right. it's like you know it's a lot of noise and then if you convert it to an fft and a gravitational wave will look like sort of a line a mm -hmm. curve really on that signal um so it's relatively fixed in frequency but it's not quite the same because the earth is moving and so you get this sort of arc across the fft okay um, yeah what then are you what what is your machine learning stuff outputting? Are you it? It's trying to detect the arc, so it's just yes or no. Is there an okay. arc or not? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Trying to see yeah. just like the presence or absence of if there are black holes that are orbiting each other. Yep. Okay. Neat. That seems pretty straightforward. Uh, we talked about this a little bit before, but in the novel, the three body problem, I think in the later series, they they have a concept of being able to send messages through gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. Do you, I guess, I guess most of the stuff you've been doing is like signal processing. So like for sure you could read a signal if, if someone was broadcasting a signal yeah. in gravitational waves. Do you have any insight into what it would take to broadcast a message in gravitational waves? Could someone uh, do that? You would have to be able to, there, there's two ways you could do it. One is you could get two black holes to collapse into each other somehow okay. or two neutron stars, or you could change the frequency that they're oscillating at uh both okay. of those seem incredibly difficult there'd be um, a lot of energy yeah yes but you could for example like if you crashed a big enough asteroid into a neutron star maybe you could get it to collapse into it but then how would you it it'd be very difficult you could probably send like two bytes two bits of information like if you did one neutron star collapse and then another one and then another like, like <laughs> <laughs> you, okay. you might yeah you might be able to send a couple, couple of bits of information probably more yeah. energy efficient ways to to send that then Yes, you're trying I, to say I imagine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. I guess light light would be pretty. Oh, here's a question. Do gravitational waves travel faster than the speed of light? If you had some nope. way of No, just have the speed of light. Not okay. speed of light. Gravity, as far as we know, travels at the speed of light. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. If you had to send a message across the galaxy, what method would you use to do that? I think this is in the three body problem as well. Um, but circling giant solar shades around a sun is a pretty good idea. Yeah. Um, because you could 
block you could just you know if you had like a solar sa- sail the size of a planet yeah um you could and you put a lot of them around a star you could like yep. morse code the light from that star in one direction um that seems pretty pretty good yeah because light travels faster than anything we can we know about so far and we already have a light source so you don't have to worry about the energy of transmitting right so you just have to worry about the energy of blocking it off which like in that process you could be harvesting the energy if you're collecting it from solar panels or something else okay yeah seems reasonable good i've got a message i need to send which is what I'm <laughs> trying to figure out D- um, don't don't do it if you believe the dark forest that's right that's right <laughs> oh have you seen the area of space where it's totally black and it no doesn't look like it sh- there's like a huge area of space where there's no stars or anything coming out of it and it looks statistically unlikely for that big of an area to be that dark. So the theory is that there is one of these super advanced civilizations that's just blocking out every single star. But then in the dark forest, you sort of think like, well, they're kind of like calling attention to themselves there. So that wouldn't be a very smart move. So if there's any other advanced civilizations <laughs> in the galaxy, like they'd be going after that one. Yeah, yeah it's cool stuff. I, I like thinking about it. Uh, cool. Anything else from this last week? Uh, not really. I, that's, I mean, I was gone most of the week for Thanksgiving, and uh, that's what I did. A lot of cackle stuff. Then it sounds like it's time for me to talk about yes. one of the worst things that's happened to me in my entire life. You we, uh, you, you hinted at this, and I have no idea what it is. So Yeah, it sucks. What, what happened? So <laughs> on Wednesday, I was going through my finances, just like logging, I go through about once a month and uh, check the balance of stuff and add it to a spreadsheet. And I saw on the two places that I store crypto uh, in interest earning accounts, uh, I have them stored in BlockFi and Gemini Earn. And on both of those, there was a new banner that popped up that I hadn't seen before that mentioned that uh, they wouldn't be able to honor the SLA for withdrawals. That if you wanted to withdraw your money, they, they could no longer... <laughs> yep <laughs> this is going where you think it's going there's FT- ftx ripples right this is ftx ripples oh, and man. uh the sla is like you should be able to withdraw your funds within five days and they were like we're not able to do that and i was like huh interesting i thought these were separate companies that uh would not be affected by ftx and felt like it was pretty i so like the deal the deal that i made with them the the proposition was like you can store your crypto on in their accounts and then it's interest earning and it's like a reasonable inter- it's not like these crazy like 20 percent interest rates it was like it was like two percent for bitcoin mm-hmm. and i was like okay well that kind of makes sense because uh you know that that's roughly what i would get from a savings account now and banks do magical things with money to be able to like do loans and then they keep some of the money and they give some of the money to people and okay yeah sure two percent sounds reasonable um and the Gemini Earn Company is like, you know, that's that's the Winklevoss twins. That's like a big established thing. And they have uh, uh, relationships with the banks and all that. And so I was like, yeah, okay, cool. And I'm going to be extra safe. I'm going to diversify. I'm going to have it in these two different things, not not put all of it in, in one exchange. And so I start feeling uneasy looking at these banners. And I'm like, huh, wonder what's uh, going on here. So I go to the subreddits for BlockFi and Gemini Earn and see that everybody is freaking out. And they're like, uh this money's gone and they're gonna go through bankruptcy and it sucks and my stomach drops and i'm like oh no (laughs) this this is terrible uh and here an an interesting angle of this that i'd like to talk to you about is like i've i've lived through a lot of crypto crashes i even just as soon as last week we were talking about crypto crashing and i was like time to buy more it's on sale uh (laughs) and feeling fine about it and like there there was a time uh uh, about a year ago where the amount of crypto i had was worth about five times what it was as of a week ago and so i framed that like three quarters drop very differently than framing potentially like losing all of it because yeah I, it was as if i had this lottery ticket of like well the next time crypto goes up i could still like earn that all back and you know this game of the money going up and down like that that's something i understand that's that's part of the game of investing uh, and this is a part of my portfolio that uh, I, I've already sort of mentally categorized as like 
if it dropped to zero, which is incredibly unlikely, because I, I believe in like the the, yep. <laughs> the value proposition of crypto, like I, I would still be okay. Sarah and I would still be okay. Like we're not going to lose a house. Uh, we, we have a, a a friend who went crazy in crypto investing uh, a couple of months ago and like got out personal loans and was doing all this leveraging stuff and and then eventually like lost all of it. And that sucks. And that's that's not where this was. This was just like uh, a modest. Uh, I think I think fifteen percent of my net worth of our savings was was in these two exchanges. So things looked a little bit better for Gemini Earn because Gemini Earn was like, well, we're looking at this buyout and we're part of this bigger company. And but BlockFi was like, are they going to go bankrupt or are they not? Found out as of this morning, uh, BlockFi did uh, file for bankruptcy, and I think that means it's gone. I think that means in a in a bankruptcy proceeding that you pay out your biggest debtors first. I don't fully understand it still, but there's no way that it, like any individual investor is going to see any of of their money back, and that really sucks. Uh, it's it's yeah, it's it's not even like the most amount of money that I've ever lost because like you know right before that was this three quarters drop, but it just it hits different to know that this happened because of this btx thing and uh like fraud and like there's there's specific people i can blame for it right like <laughs> i yeah. know the names of, whereas you know if the market goes down that's just sort of like well you know we're all on this together and uh so yeah it uh it sucks and <laughs> I'm, I'm getting some solace and just like telling people about it i don't know it just <laughs> uh yeah it sucks and and that's that's all uh I, I would appreciate your condolences for losing a whole bunch of money. Yeah, that is absolutely terrible. Um, I think the oh, I'm trying to find upsides, right? The uh, it, the story's not done yet, so mm -hmm. maybe they go into bankruptcy, maybe they don't. Maybe mm -hmm. they have customer funds, maybe they don't. Um, if it happens to be like a Mount Gox situation, then it's possible that if they misled people enough, then they get sued and they even through bankruptcy can't discharge like customer funds. Mm. So, which means that you have a possibility of getting your money back maybe like in five or 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there's that. Um, what happened with Mountain Gox? Did it, it, it is still going through bankruptcy. They, as far really? as I know, haven't paid out anything, but they got some other Bitcoin back, which means they have Bitcoin to give out. Interesting. Um, so as far as I understand, I, my information could be way outdated, but okay. I think some people will get some money back. Well, that's, that's reassuring. This, yeah. this will continue to be an interesting <laughs> saga in my life then for the next 10 years. Yeah. Uh, just, yeah, the, the hope that some of it. I, I, I also hope if it comes back, it would come back in the form of Bitcoin because like the whole reason i was doing anything in crypto was this this sort of speculation of that it's going to be worth more in the future than it right. is right now so if you wait and hold five years right on, it's possible yeah. it could be worth like a whole bunch of money right. uh yeah oh man it, it this so i i have several questions based off of this that i've sort of been chewing on uh the first is how so like the the amount of money that i lost is like you know more than a year's salary probably like I don't know, a, a year and a half or, or two years, which sucks. Um, and it sort of got me thinking, like, I'm working day to day on projects that, uh, you know, are making me some money in the in the short term. And like, I'm making all these smaller decisions to uh, build up these projects. And then and then a shitty part of me is like, oh, man, but if I had spent just like one fraction of that effort of decision making, just like instead of having my money in this place, it's in this other place instead that would have had so much more of an impact than like all of the decisions i've made in the last year and that's a weird thought and i think i'm curious what your mental model of that is like like all this stuff with google is all of your conscious attention and all the all the work that you're doing but like a single investment decision could be worth more than that and could also like wipe all of that out and that's scary and also just like i don't know it's it's got me it's got, it's got me like rethinking all of my investments of like am i sure that, that you know this long-term bet that i'm making of the the stock market is generally going to go up about four percent per year after uh, after inflation like is that accurate 
should I should I buy a bunch of gold? Like, uh, in in conversations with Sarah about this, uh, I was reaffirmed also that like Sarah is a good life partner because I went to her and talked to her about this. And she was like, "Well, that sucks." All right, let's talk about what we should do next. Uh, it that like yeah, it. it I, I think there were much shittier ways that, that we could have had that conversation. Um, so one of the decisions I think we're going to make is to uh, pay off the condo. Uh, so take a bunch of money that was invested in the stocks uh, and just make sure that we own the condo outright, which is a, a like shoring stuff up, making it making it much safer. But how do, how do you think about that? How do you mentally frame stuff you're doing day to day versus this higher level investment decision that is potentially much higher impact? Uh, I think there's no no easy answers. Um, it's also extremely uh, personal in terms of what risk tolerance like you're willing to take. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, no easy answers. Like like you got to think about it. Also, like yeah, we talked. I think we talked off off air about this. Like I knew about Bitcoin at a dollar, and yeah. like I remember it crossing a dollar and being like, "That's stupid. Why would anyone <laughs> buy virtual currency for a dollar?" Yeah. Um, and so anytime I think about that, like, you know, it kind of makes me sick, right? I could have bought, yeah. I could have spent a uh, hundred bucks and then been totally set or a thousand bucks or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't. And so it's actually kind of freeing because whatever decisions I make with money are not going to be as bad as that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, uh, uh. instead I try to make smart decisions, right? I try to diversify, right? Uh, s- seeing systemic problems like ftx collapsing is not something you can necessarily like like don't beat yourself up about it right mm. it's the same with the subprime mortgage cra- mortgage crash in 2008 like people yeah. big banks couldn't see the systemic risk and so whole banks went bankrupt and you know ruined people's lives yeah um at least your life isn't ruined and i think that's because yeah. you had some risk tolerance but not you know you weren't all in right yeah so um yeah, that's all I can say, I guess, is uh, also you have skills that are extremely marketable. And so don't leverage your future on, you know, lotto tickets and yeah. you should be okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Several interesting points there. Thank you, by the way. This is, I'm, I'm feeling much better. Uh, <laughs> the first is like this idea that it's, it, it like in contrast to this, other risks seem much more reasonable. Like it can't possibly be as bad as that. I, I had a friend who, recently uh is working on uh, building a house and they gave twenty thousand dollars to a builder and then the builder disappeared and yeah. now they're in small claims court and at the time when they were first telling me that story i was like wow twenty thousand dollars that sucks that's so much money <laughs> and, but like in the wake of this happening the amount of money that we lost is more than twenty thousand dollars and so now i'm thinking like well that's bad but it's not as bad as what i just went through <laughs> right uh and yeah like it's it's okay it's uh like it sucks but it's you know i having having gone through it now i feel like it's uh yeah i i I am made stronger by this i also like the angle of focusing on the marketable skills Uh, like there was actually very little of this that was in my control i think that the core decision i made I made years ago and continued to make every time I did this finance tracking, which was like, do I trust keeping my own money in this exchange? And the answer, like, you know, we talked about crypto stuff last week and the answer last week was like, yeah, of course. Yeah. This it's, it's been with them this whole time. Like I, for, for me to have, for me to have like discovered and been wise to this and, and been able to make the withdrawal in time to be able to do it. Uh, I, I would have to be so much more vigilant than I am right now. So like I've, I've learned from this and I'm, I'm tuning my risk tolerance a little bit lower of, you know, I'm going to be much more skeptical, especially in the crypto space, especially with uh, new investment companies. I'm not going to be putting a bunch of money with them. So that's a, a lesson to be learned. But like, you know, even, even if at the very first hint of rumblings of uh, BTX going down, like I think Patrick McKinsey tweeted something about this two or three weeks ago. Uh, reading through the subreddit even people who tried to withdraw their money then were not able to so i would yeah. have had to have sniffed this out before that and like i i i couldn't have done that that it was outside of my control uh the the person who i was and the risk tolerance i had I, I was continuing to make the decision to to keep the money with them so yeah all right cool and so the the way i've been framing this i did a bunch of gratitude journaling like okay what in my yeah. life 
do I have right now that I haven't really been consciously appreciating? That's worth more than the amount of money that we lost. And uh, there's a lot. Like, both my parents are still alive and in good health, and that's worth way more than the amount of money that I lost. And I, I feel incredibly thankful for that. Uh, I have a good relationship with Sarah. Uh, a, a lot more, like, personal stuff. But, yeah, there's a lot of things in my life that, that I feel very thankful for uh, that are, are more valuable than this. And importantly, like... I've got this goal of making $20,000 a month from SaaS stuff. If I'm making $20,000 a month, that's cash flow that I can choose to be investing however I want. And then investments are, are going to grow, uh, especially having them in more conservative places. Um, and then, you know, building a company that's making $20,000 a month at a conservative 5x multiple, that's 20 times 12 times 5, is $1.2 million. And that's so much more than the amount of money that we lost. Uh, so that feels kind of good if like that's something that's in my control that's something that i can focus on and like the the amount of money that you can lose is kind of bounded unless you're doing crazy stuff with uh leveraging but the amount of money that you can gain like over the course of my life i think i think i like to think that this is just going to be a tiny blip of like ah remember when that shitty thing happened that show was shitty isn't it great that i'm making so much money now <laughs> but uh yeah it's I've, I've i've worked through a lot of complicated feelings and uh uh yeah it sucks and it's gonna be okay yeah, that's exactly why I th like you could look back and say maybe you should have done something differently, but I actually think your risk tolerance was f fine. Like you, you given your skills and ability to make money and the amount of money that you you know have versus what you were risking in this way, mm -hmm. and that you didn't leverage it. So like if you took out a mortgage and bet all on black, you know, and roulette, yeah, that's a very different thing than yeah. you putting in some money and happening, you know, and losing it because you know of some you know fdx going bad yeah so like yes you could beat yourself up that you should do something differently but in the end i think like it's a risk that you took that you knew that you were taking and i think it was an, an okay risk given your risk tolerance and your ability to make money and your stage of life happened to not pay out um or maybe in 10 years you'll get some money back right <laughs> like you, you know it's possible it is yeah. very, it's hard to say so it's <laughs> i have a lottery a ticket for a uh a lot of it's the it's the probably the highest probability lottery ticket I could ever buy, right? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Uh, this yeah. this company going bankrupt uh, owes me this amount of of crypto. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, it something sucks, that's going to be difficult but, for me in the future. Yeah. Like, I think I think for right now, the investment I want to make is like pay off the house, just just shore things up, be more conservative. Mm. What's going to be interesting going forward is once cash flow starts going back up, and I have a choice of like, okay, I have this pile of money where does it go well this amount for sure goes into stocks this amount for sure goes into retirement funds but i have this amount left over that i can invest and i'm going to want to invest in crypto again and i guess we'll get there when we get there <laughs> but like i think i think mentally i just say you know the money that i had invested in these two firms is gone oh i do have a i do have a small glimmer of hope with gemini earn because that like it's i, I had about half and half uh in each of these so like it's possible gemini earn is is a little bit more legit and it's a bigger company it's part of a bigger thing and they're in talks with somebody to bail them out or something it, it's complicated i don't fully understand it but it's possible i get the money from that back or part of it but also i don't want to hold on to that as a hope because <laughs> probably not going to happen yeah. uh but but like between that and BlockFi, like once they go through bankruptcy maybe 10 years from now maybe i'll get some of it back uh yeah but i'm rambling a little bit but yeah that's okay. that's where we are yeah yeah i mean uh of the two i know like the wink false twins as far as i know aren't going anywhere and so right. if they want to ever operate as a financial anything again ever then they yes. had better make some of, at least some of their customers whole so, yeah. yeah yeah i would think so i would hope so reading through it apparently like their their earned product was a separate company mm. which of course it was and i'm sure they're like of course personally protected it yeah right. it's yeah i don't know well we'll see what happens they they yeah. haven't applied for bankruptcy yet so okay we'll see yeah um, la last question uh, would it be indelicate of me to title this uh, episode dude where's my crypto <laughs> <laughs> you have to you have to you have to you have to title <laughs> <laughs> this podcast this podcast has just been a t t a documentary <laughs> of me losing uh <laughs> valuable things <laughs> got your car back though and you got your I laptop back. Car back and i also got the laptop back right so, like all these things have all these things have come back <laughs> this is just this is just the third act <laughs>
Oh, man. Every time it's been like more valuable. Well, no, the car and the laptop, I think we're like roughly <laughs> the same amount of value. <laughs> oh, gosh. No, you have to. That's the perfect. <laughs> All right. How long have you been thinking about that? That was that was good. About 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you did so well staying with me emotionally. I, I would have... <laughs> As, if I was in your position, as soon as I started talking about it, I would have, I would have started cracking up. Oh, gosh. All right. Thank you. Thank you for being with me through through these difficult times. Uh, cool. Okay. All right. On to, on to better news. Uh, yeah. The video clipper. I don't know. So, okay. Here, here's, here's what's going on, and then I'll get your take on, like, if I can say this person's name. There is a another book author who reached out uh, through like their own personal channel and uh, they recently published a book and I saw that they had done a thing that they call a, uh, a video book version of their book which I was like a video book what's that and I went through and it's like it's a, it's a animated version of all of their chapters of the book it's like this two hour long video of, of all the chapters and so I emailed them back and was like hey this is really cool I've never seen this before have you thought about publishing this on social media and they responded, which was really cool. I'm emailing all these like creators and authors and stuff, and they're responding to me like, this, this is awesome. Yeah. Uh, and they responded and said, uh, oh, yeah, actually, I'm also publishing them on YouTube. You can subscribe on YouTube. And I said, oh, that's awesome. Have you thought about syndicating this on other social networks? I'm building a thing that makes it easier to like automatically uh, uh, you know, edit and format and, and publish it on different networks. And uh, they asked me a few questions about it, and I, I responded back to those questions. Um, they wanted to know if... Uh, the importing could happen programmatically and i was like well eventually yes but right now i'm just doing it manually and then eventually i'll, I'll have automations to do it uh and they said yeah i'm on board so my first question is like how would you be framing if it's okay to talk about this person on the podcast should i be getting explicit permission or like this is a well-known person who's doing this well-known thing like what, what's what's the danger of me saying who they are uh i mean the danger is ugh, there's two dangers one they find out and they don't want to use a product anymore because they say that's kind of a crappy thing to do yeah um uh, and then the second is like they sue you if you use their name right yeah. um people can sue for anything so i would ask them first i guess uh, this is yeah. this is kind of like this is the same question as if a company a well-known company is your user can yes. you put their logo on your web page yeah this yeah, is the yeah. same thing and generally i think the courts say you have to ask first so. yes okay okay i think this person is going to say yes so i think i think i'll send them a quick email and be like hey is it okay if I talk about that you? Because eventually, I'd like to have a case study of this person. Yeah. So I think I, I think I just ask about the case study, sort of generically, of like, is it okay if I talk about that yeah. you're using this thing? Okay. Okay. That's what I'll do. So I, I won't say their their name first. Um. Okay. Next question is, what do I do from this point? So I, I, this person's interested in using it, and. I sent the the last correspondence we had was I sent them an email that said uh, sign up for an account on this page, and I already have access to your video, so I'm going to work on setting up your account and setting up templates and uh, you know making making the clips of each individual chapter. Um, what should happen next? Here's here's what I want the end goal to be. I have like this person has used it, and they're uh, regularly publishing clips on all these social media accounts, and they have all those authenticated. And I have a case study page of them that says, you know, they started with their TikTok page having this many followers. And since using Clipstar Marketing, <laughs> it was minimal effort on their part. And now they have this many followers. And how great is that? Uh, how, do, how do I get from where I am to, oh, and also I want them to be paying me money. I want them to be one of the <laughs> right. $100 a month customers. So how, how would you bridge that gap? I would start by doing absolutely everything you could to make them happy, uh, which means uh, making it very, very easy for them to get started, which probably means a lot of manual work to import all our videos. I would mm -hmm. do, yeah, do all that with zero expectation that they, mm -hmm. that, you know, they even sign up or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like they already signed up, but um, this is kind of like, I, I keep going back to the ConvertKit Nathan Berry uh, playbook because this is very similar, though in a different domain. Mm -hmm. So he got a lot of people onboarded by doing this manual concierge thing, which is mm -hmm. like, like I will do all this work to set up your account for you, like mm -hmm. way more than it's worth <laughs> to, you know, of my time. And in order to get you like actually using it and, and chucked out, um, and that might mean multiple calls to like, you know, have a walk through it. Um, and then at each step, I would ask, is this what you want? If not, you know, what, what do you want? How can I, how can I make what you want? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And hopefully by the end you have some, but also 
you know never imply that this is free forever i guess and mm-hmm. like say you know this is you know you know working towards getting you on this plan can i set up a call with you to make sure that everything i've imported is what you want or whatever yeah um yeah that's what i would do just spend a lot of time with them i this is evidence of of product uh, uh audience founder fit the idea of like being on a phone call with this person excites me so much like cool. i've, I've wanted yeah. to talk awesome. to this person for 10 years awesome. uh and like to have a, a legitimate reason to, to talk to them would be really cool um okay yes i agree that like from from the beginning my goal right now should just be make them as happy as possible for as little work on their part as possible so like yeah i want to be formatting the clip in a way that fits with their brand and i want to be uh doing all the clipping for them like the the nathan berry style and yeah just just make that as seamless and, and easy as possible so from from this person's perspective the product that i would want is like i click a button to sign up for an account and then magically my videos show up in the account and they're already titled and everything i don't need to do anything with that and then i just click some buttons to link my social media accounts and then maybe send an email that says i'd like to be publishing these once a day and i'd like them all to be synced up and then it just happens what do you think about uh watermarking the clips until they pay me money hmm. which i think is going to be like my generic yeah. deal for for most people if it's a well-known person they're not going to want watermarks for sure which, which means i wouldn't hmm. i wouldn't i would instead try to set the tone that like you know, I'm trying to get you set up to be on this plan. As soon as you're happy, then I'll consider you sign up for the plan right. and you pay me money, right? Right. Um, maybe you don't say it like that, obviously, but I would do everything unwatermarked for free until you get them happy. Okay. With like the messaging being, at that point, you'll pay me money. That's what I would do, yeah. Okay. Do everything unwatermarked. Yeah. Okay. The reason why is because it's yeah. not just for this one person, right? Uh, right? You get a case study out of it. You right. get a well-known person. You can then put it on your website. Right. Also, what Nathan Barry said specifically that I remember is like he would go to different verticals, and as soon as he got like three people signed up in a vertical, like say, like it's like you know, track, uh, fit bloggers or whatever. Right. I don't know. Um, as soon as he got like three people, everyone in the space knows about everyone else. Right. And so as soon as he got three people signed up the other hundred were like everyone is switching to convert kit right and so they just switched yes so this would be the same thing as soon as you get this person signed up go to their peers try to get one or two more then send cold emails to the rest of their peers and yep. be like hey they switched and by yeah. that time hopefully you have the self-service down shoot i keep doing that <laughs> okay i we're now gonna that have i a... know who it is absolutely talk to him as much as possible that's awesome <laughs> yeah we will uh, uh but so we'll bleep it from, out. The, from the listener's perspective you probably just had a, a bleeped <laughs> a bleeped out <laughs> that's it's so hard not because i'm saying i'm saying this person's name in my head and then i censor it okay <laughs> if i'm thinking of any cl- uh, thought of like any sort of complexity then i just i just blurt it out okay yeah, yeah but 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 imagine making him happy means 100 more people sign up like that's yes. the type of thing i would think about yeah okay okay and then anyone else in the space i can go to so anyone else like at that level i could go to and be like hey this person who you know of is yep. using my thing and here's a link to his case study would you also like to to use this thing okay yep. and yeah that's and I'd, I'd prefer that over if he's paying me money and of course if he offered to pay me money or was like what does this cost i don't yeah, think i would I, turn that down right at the, at, the, at the the whole time i'd be working towards you know i'm going to make you happy so that you sign up for this plan like right. i would set that expectation at the beginning never never make it all about free forever right. be like you know i'm gonna make you as happy as possible and then when you're happy you can sign up for this plan yeah okay yeah okay yeah because they they also have um we've revealed the gender already he also has <laughs> he also has a uh a bunch of backlogs of like videos from interviews and things so uh i, I think i think this is more than just this one project uh for this one book this this could be like an, an ongoing thing and also it's you know just for the book project it's a whole bunch of clips that i think the core value is going to be in uh not just formatting the videos that's that's part of the value but the second part of the value is going to be like dripping them out like a like a buffer style thing right um okay cool that sounds good um so that's where that is 
Uh, oh, product update. On. Oh, my, what's going on? My Mac is low battery. One sec. Oh, that's a problem. Not as big of a problem as losing a whole bunch of money. On oh. I, I thought it was plugged in for the last couple of hours, but it wasn't. So there we go. All right, now it's plugged in. Are the new batteries? You have a one of the one of the M series laptops, right? No, this is this is the Intel one. Oh, the Intel one. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. I'm, I'll notice on my laptop. I'll like take it for a trip and bring the charger, and it's a week long trip, and I won't charge it a single time. <laughs> I'll just <laughs> let's keep going. Yeah. Um, okay. Other other product updates for the video clipper. I can now render square videos that was uh, and, and it's smoother uh, so you, you can go on each clip and hit download and download in square and it formats it and I'm slowly walking through being able to do theming so like changing the font and changing the color and changing the style and uh, the the color of the little progress bar that goes in the bottom um, I'm still trying to keep this pretty minimal and make the, the customizations more based on colors and, and background images and things but uh, we're at a point now where it's like as soon as I as soon as I enable two more of those customizations of uh, font yeah the font and I think that's it actually yeah just the font uh, and then push that this is now a thing that Brian can be using like to publish videos on, on different social media accounts. Um, and then I have a Twitter integration, but that's not quite integrated in the new system. So that'll be the next thing to roll out that he can just click a button and it automatically gets queued to, to publish uh, once a day on Twitter. So that's cool. Um, I, I think I'd like to talk through with you the roadmap of like as a product when I start charging people. I think, I think roughly what that looks like right now is uh, wrapping up the clip rendering I also need to throw uh, portrait mode on there, which I, I haven't done yet, but that should be pretty straightforward. I'm just duplicating what the square one was. Um, I need to be able to render with a watermark. I can't do that yet. And then I need to add billing. So that means like making a Stripe account, doing my uh, integration with Firebase and Stripe, which I've, I've done a few times now. That's pretty straightforward. And then uh, setting up just the really simple logic of uh, if you're on a free plan, you can do everything but you, all the videos that you export are going to be watermarked with the video clipper somewhere in the video. Um, and then if you are on a paid plan, you can remove the watermark. And I think we talked about like the, the different, there's two different tiers of, of, uh, of plans for that. Um, and then once I'm at that stage, once I can render video and I can charge people money, I think I do like a beta launch. I think I'd email, uh, I have roughly a hundred people who have signed up on the list. Not quite that. I think it's like 70 people. Um, on the beta list and the email all them and say, hey, this is a product you can actually use and pay me for now. Here's where it currently is. And then I think I offer to like manually onboard everybody because I'm sure there's going to be a whole bunch of rough edges of this person wants this crazy thing and I don't know how to do that yet. Um, yeah. And then I make back the money I lost <laughs> from BlockFi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's, your, what's your take on that? Uh, that sounds great. Um, that sounds like a good plan. I also be cognizant of the holidays. So like December is like a weird time. So if yeah. it takes you a month until January to do all that, I think that's fine. Because okay. I think most people will not look at something like this until next year. Yep. So, okay. Yeah. Otherwise, we're good. Cool. It feels straightforward. It feels like manageable. Uh, I posted about this on Hacker News about the uh, losing money. And oh. I got a ton of comments of people <laughs> saying that uh i'm dumb for investing my money this way but also offering yeah. some condolences of uh that i lost the money and they're saying basically the same thing that in bankruptcy i probably won't get any money back but it's possible like in a, a really long time from now so yeah. yep all right that's that's about what i thought uh okay next thing file inbox this last week had a lot of server outages which was interesting mm -hmm. I, I have automated alerts set up if the servers go down and it was fine. It automatically booted back up, but I was just re-reminded that, like, oh yeah, the serverless thing is like the reason I was that that was that's my solution for this happening, and right. it just hasn't happened in a long time. Um, so, it's it's an interesting stage of work right now because I have a bunch of exciting things happening for the video clipper, and also file inbox is at like ninety percent done, and feels like it needs another push. I feel like I just need to work like four times harder, <laughs> and uh, yeah. I, I'll be able to, to push both of these th these things uh, through. Uh, what what advice would you give me on file inbox stuff? I think two um, weeks ago you said just go all in on the video clipper, mm -hmm. but 
it's it's you know that's probably a month away from being in this place where i can be charging people um, yeah it might be time to TikTok back and do a little work on filing box just to yeah. see what the next thing is you can push forward um that also reminds me your server's going down reminds me that i think today is the day heroku takes off free servers oh uh, yeah and i still have more than one thing running on free servers <laughs> that's a problem so i either have to transition those or just don't care uh we'll see i would hope they don't just delete them but that they keep the image form and give you the option of like hey it went down but you can click this button to give us money and it goes back up that is what i'm wondering and i really want to back up the databases before i find out because <laughs> some of them like <laughs> One of them is a screencast site that I've had up for a while about React, mm -hmm. and it probably has a few hundred people on a mailing list that's in a database mm -hmm. on the free Heroku tier. So I should back that up before I lose a few hundred emails. Not like that. I'll never email them, I guess. But yeah. uh, anyway, advice about filing box. Yeah. So just maybe it's time to TikTok back a little bit, especially since you probably have till mid January before people really look at fo at video clipper um, yep. seriously so uh, plan your time accordingly i guess okay it's been a while since i've, I've talked about file inbox and thought about it then so I'd, I'd love to talk through the same sort of roadmap of what the next things to do are i think so that the core thing i'm trying to get done is to be able to transition people from the existing rails app to the new serverless app um there's like three features supported on the old app that aren't currently supported on the new app. One of those is embedding. One of those is a uh, Google Drive integration. One of those is a security code that locks the page when you try to submit files. And then I think that's it. Uh, and then there's, a, there's other stuff around the site of like, I need to make sure that the blog still works and I need to make sure that the uh, uh, onboarding is in place and I need to like move over the, the onboarding. I have like a, a wizard that comes up and helps you make your first page. Um, and then there's going to be other stuff like my user list account is, is on Rails, but it's not on this. So that's going to need to get moved over. Um, I guess I just like slowly march through each of those. And then when it gets to a point of parity, then I, I start migrating over users. Um. Yeah, I mean, one also. thing. One thing I could just say is just do it. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, just work on it. <laughs> um, I also thought to ask, what is the next person who's going to move over, and what do they need before they move over? Um, yes. I seem to remember Google Drive. Like, some customers waiting on Google Drive yeah. integration to move yeah. over. So maybe I've got a customer waiting on Google Drive. I've got a customer waiting on uh, embeds, and that yep. would bring two more people over. So I'll do them in that order and try to get those two people over. I think okay. I'll know a lot more. Yeah. Cool. I like that. All right. Yeah. Just do it. Good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> just, just do it. <laughs> just do it. Uh, <laughs> cool. I, I will say, like, working on these and framing it, I feel like I know a lot more about marketing now and, and have a much better sense of, like, oh, the thing I'm building is just a machine that can acquire people for less money than the money that they're going to pay me. And that's really the core thing to be focused on. It's, uh, I think, the simplified formula for that is if your uh, customer acquisition cost is less than your uh, lifetime value, if your CAC is lower than your LTV, then you, you just keep pumping money into however you're acquiring customers. Um, and I have that framework now of like, oh, you know, this is how I can acquire customers on File Inbox, and this is how I can acquire customers on the Video Clipper. And that feels good to feel like I finally have my feet under me of being able to do this. But yeah, I, I still do get frustrated of like, stuff's not happening as fast as I would like it to. And uh, my gosh, I've been talking about the serverless transition like for as long as this podcast has, has existed. Um, Almost, yeah. yeah, so <laughs> I'd like to just get it done and <laughs> just have it be done. Uh, yeah all right I, I just need to like work harder uh and yeah okay all right good uh one last thing i am getting back into 3d printing there's some things that i need like cases for electronic stuff and like doing smart home stuff you can buy online these covers that go on your light switches but you can also 3d print them so i'm 3d printing them and it's fun and i like it cool yeah, I, I uh, every once in a while I look at 3D printer prices and, and stuff. I still haven't bought one because I know it will just sit on my shelf. So uh, we did uh, our library uh, went through a renovation and now the 3D printers, there's more of them and they're right in the library, whereas before they were like down the street. Mm. Um, 
And so my, like my wife just used it the other day. She printed a, like we are risk one of the boxes for the pieces broke. And so she printed a little, little box and it was like That's $3 so cool. and they did it all. Like she found it on Thingiverse and sent it over. And a week later she paid $3 and, and you just sent him the STL. That's really cool. Yeah. That's really, really cool. Um, so as, as long as that exists, I probably don't need to buy one. <laughs> yeah. You don't need one if, the, if you can just do that yeah. for sure. I noticed I go through this phase of tools where when I first get the tool, it's the coolest thing ever. And I'm trying to do everything with it and I'm using it every single day. And then it sort of fades in the background and then I'll have a problem legitimately crop up that this, the tool is the perfect solution to solve it. And then I'll be able to just whip it up and because I've already set it up, I've already installed the drivers and figured out what the, how to use it and, and the safety stuff with it. I'm able to just like use it and then it fades back into the background and that feels really cool. It's it's not like as exciting as the dream that I had when I was first envisioning owning this machine of, ah, every day I'll, I'll be able to use this to like, like, you know, having a table saw, ah, I'll be able to just make <laughs> cabinets every day. Yeah. And that's all I want, want to do every day. Like, no, I have my other life and my other hobbies and there's stuff that I'm, uh, you know, it, it, it's not going to, it's not going to fundamentally transform my life, but it will give me this nice little superpower of I can cut long sheets of wood very straight. And sometimes that'll be useful for this specific sort of problem. But if I can't do that, it's going to be okay. I'll find another way around it. <laughs> so, uh, but it's, I'm, I'm enjoying having more tools that are like fading into the background that are, uh, just calmly improving my life. Yeah. It's the same reason I bought my fancy graphics card. Like it's like, yes, I can rent them in the cloud, but it's nice to have it here. Mm. And, uh, it makes me think differently about it. Also, someone I, uh, once knew said, uh, like an older person was like, it's great when you do projects around the house because that means you can buy tools and your wife can't complain about the cost because <laughs> <laughs> so, it's like, it, it was like when I bought, when I, um, uh, built my deck, like I could have paid someone like the deck probably would have cost, I don't know, 15 grand or something to get someone to build it. Yeah. Uh, but I did it for, you know, 2000 of materials and a thousand dollars worth of tools. Yeah. And now I have a bunch of cool tools. Yeah. yeah um, yeah. so, uh, yeah, same thing with a 3d printer. I think I made the exact same deal with my wife about the drawers and the, the cabinets and stuff. Yeah. I was like, yes, this table saw costs $600, but <laughs> how much more expensive would it be if we like hired someone to do this? And then yep. I have infinite capacity to, to make infinite cabinets. Cool. Chris, that's all I got. That's all I got too. Then I'll see you next week. Goodbye.